The black woman was kicked out of Babouche for wearing shorts that they say violated their policies. Though Rebecca was allowed to remain in place while her pale and pasty boobs was allowed to stay and light up the darkest spaces under the table. These folks are not even from America, but have shown their true Confederate colors and had the nerve to throw that man bag out like he was going to barge in and sit in and demand service. Oh, you going to serve me in this fancy grandma studio apartment living room. This afternoon, the restaurant issued an apology on Instagram. They really locked the door behind them. As you see here, after Kevin Spacey cleared of all charges of sexual assault, all charges, that means that white privilege has once again won. Now, in reference to Hunter Biden, I wonder, after his appearance in court, after he enters a guilty plea, after these long years of federal probe and him denying such accusations, and President Biden also denies such accusation and the illegal business dealing as well as this criminal tax case. I wonder if Hunter Biden, the president's son of the United States of America, the most powerful country in the world, will serve one day in prison or will he get a prison sentence? I doubt it. I'm pretty sure he will either be pardoned or he will just be let out on probation. But if it was you or I, part of the Foundation of Black American Family, just know you'll be in jail up to 10 years entering a plea as though he did. I understand that sometimes it's hard to define what truly white privilege is because the roots of white privilege can be traced back to centuries colonization, slavery, and racial discrimination. European colonial powers exploited and subjugated black communities around the world, but especially in the United States of America to build their wealth and empowers. These historical injustices have had lasting effects on the distribution of power, resources, and opportunities across the different racial groups. See, white privilege is a term used to describe the advantages the white people have in society simply because of their race. These advantages can be both explicit and implicit and white privilege does not imply that every white individual lives a life of luxury or success, but rather they can benefit from certain advantages in society that black people may not have access to. These advantages range from better representation in media and politics. You know how they show us on media and politics, do you not? Lower chances of racial profiling and discrimination because of the depictions in media and politics. The other advantages can manifest in a variety of ways, such as having less likely to be stopped, harassed, beaten, and killed by race soldiers, a.k.a. the police, being more likely to be hired for a job that they do not qualify for over a black person who is more than qualified, being paid more for the same work, being more likely to be promoted on a job, feeling safer in public spaces, having a higher opportunity, even though you have the same credit score as them, as getting a loan for a house, a business loan, or any of the such, not having to deal with microaggressions from blacks versus us dealing with microaggressions from them and the privilege of having one million worth of whiteness in their skin that sets them above us in this white supremacist society. See, white privilege is something that all white people experience equally if they use and or know how to use it. It can be influenced by factors such as class, gender, and sexual orientation. However, it is a real phenomenon that has a significant impact on the lives of white people while degrading the lives of black people. It's important to note that talking about white privilege does not mean that I'm saying that all white people are bad or that they have never had to work hard for anything. It simply means that we are acknowledging the fact that white people have certain advantages in society that black people do not have. In addition, most of them do not have to work as hard as black people to achieve the same level of success at a particular stage and or age in their lives. Fucking job! It ain't you! It's these motherfuckers right here! 
This is the mother of the But now we got to do this shit again. So all I have to say is that. You got to do this shit again. Can nobody tell me. Can nobody here tell me why I get emotional? Why you talk to me? That's fine. That's fine. You can do that. You don't know where I'm going to do that. You can do that. I'm going to pass off to this motherfucker. Exactly. I'm going to have 30-something motherfucking years. I agree too. 30-something fucking years. I agree too. You tell me I ain't got no motherfucking attention. I agree too. Yeah, and nobody tell me to calm my ass down. Fuck you. everybody tell me to calm down. God damn it. This is my motherfucking money y'all playing with. Right. You're right, Dwayne. Fuck that right. shit. So, so this is right. what I'll say. You gonna right. tell me how the motherfucking feel. Fuck that shit, man. So this is what I'll say. Fuck this right. shit. Okay. Anytime, anytime the government... I don't laugh. Anytime the shit. government bails out a corporation... Right. One way to think about it, white privilege is to imagine a world where everyone is treated equally regardless of their race. In this world, there would be no racial disparities in areas such as education, employment, housing, and law. Everyone had the same opportunity to succeed regardless of their race. There are still significant racial disparities in our society, especially when it comes to foundational black Americans. However, by talking, exposing, revealing, and demanding the same right and privileges, we can start to challenge these disparities and work towards a more just and equitable society. Because when you define white privilege, right, it's a set of advantages that white individuals unconsciously receive due to their skin color, which is deeply ingrained in various social, economic, and political structures. These benefits are often inherited and systematically given White individuals' advantages in opportunities, resources, and treatment compared to their black counterparts. Because historical context tell us to comprehend the impact of white privilege on black Americans, it's essential to dive into the histories because centuries of slavery, segregation, and institutional racism have laid the foundation for the enduring disparities that persist in modern day times. Because white privilege is intertwined with systematic discrimination which perpetuates racial inequalities across various institutions. From the criminal justice system to employment opportunities, black Americans often face disproportionate challenges and biases. The criminal justice system is just another domain where white privilege is apparent. Black individuals are disproportionately targeted by law enforcement, leading to higher incarceration rates and harsher sentences compared to white individuals for the same crimes. Quite frankly, the opposite of privilege is oppression. When I look at this gentleman here, it states that the U.S. stands alone as one of the few advanced countries that allow people convicted of felonies to be blocked from voting after they leave prison. Your time is up. You served your time. You did the crime. You served your time. You should be fully instated as a citizen just as well as any other country. But when you're living in a system of white privilege and white supremacy and you understand the construct in which you live in, that black people are disproportionately targeted, you can understand the high incarceration rates of our brothers and sisters. When I take Roy Harness, for example, who is a 60-year-old social worker, they state here who may never be able to vote because of a crime committed decades ago. In the mid-1980s, he was convicted of forgery after he ran up a debt to a drug dealer and cashed a series of fake checks. He spent nearly two years in prison and hasn't been back since. In recent years, Harness, who is also an Army veteran, has been on a new path. He enrolled in college when he was 55 and got his bachelor's degree when he was 63. He got a master's degree in 2019. Now a full-time social worker, Harness keeps a shelf behind his desk filled with awards and accomplishments, a reminder to his clients of all they can accomplish. So in this country, regardless of your rehabilitation, the system of white supremacy understands that the mass majority of those who are incarcerated are black Americans. And in order to continue to subjugate us, is to null and void our vote, our freedom of choice to represent us and with the possibility of reparations on the table. So to kind of do a deeper dive into voting because we're coming up on an election year, here's a map of the different states and how they handle those who have had a felony on their record. Those that are orange and stripes, it states that some people with felony convictions cannot vote. Those in solid orange 
people with felony convictions can vote upon completions of their sentence. Now, there's a lot of gray area there. So you completed your sentence, but are you still on probation? See, you can complete your 10-year, 5-year, 20-year sentence, but they may also have you on probation for another 20 years. So you cannot vote for an entirety of 40 years, which may be the extent of your life. In blue, it states people in prison cannot vote. Everyone else can vote. See, I can understand you not having the privilege of being a sentence because you are incarcerated. But again, this is the fabric. This is the design. The key to it is to lock up, kill, and frame as many as black Americans as you can. Because soon here, we're going to stop to depending on the black vote. And we're going to start depending on the Hispanic vote. We're going to start depending on the Asian vote. And this is mainly pointed towards the Democratic Party. Because the Republicans don't pay black people no attention. And we shouldn't pay them no attention until something tangible is on the table like reparations. And in the green, everyone has the right to vote. Which, how it should be, and when they state that everyone has the right to vote, that means that you're incarcerated or not. And I can understand that paradigm as well. You say I make you nervous, a tragedy, a more beautiful disaster, a reckoning. You wonder how I got this way. You think I'm someone to be saved. Someone to clean up and tame Oh, some things never change Never change, oh You think I would look pretty On your arm once you cover all my bruises And battle scars But it always ends the same Can't bear the things of I to face Got you crying on your knees in pain Oh, some things never change Americans are more likely to experience poverty, lack of access to capital, and limited opportunities for upward mobility compared to their white counterparts, right? White privilege also plays a role in the job market. Unconscious bias can lead employers to favor white job applicants over equally or more qualified black candidates. Additionally, white individuals may have access to more extensive professional networks that can open doors to exclusive job opportunities. That's called the good old buddy network. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We networking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I look at the disparities in employment, we must show some references. Now, according to this particular governmental site, it states, we study the effects of race and a prison record on employment with a large-scale field experiment conducted in New York City. In this study, teams of black and white men were watched and sent to apply for hundreds of low-wage jobs throughout the city, presenting equivalent resumes and differing only in their race and criminal background. These results build upon an earlier work pointing to a robust interaction between race and criminal background. Furthermore, this research allows us to look with more detail into the interpersonal contact between job seekers and employers for some insight into the process by which race and criminal background translate into labor market disadvantages. It states here, we found a significant negative effect of a criminal record on employment outcomes and one that appears substantially larger for black Americans. It's an evil world we live in. And this is from your governmental website. So you can dispute it all you want, but this is the truth as they see it. So this is the truth as we experience it. Now, when it comes to education, white privilege also manifests strongly within our education system where black students often confront inferior resources, underfunded schools, and biased disciplinary practices hindering our academic progress, does it not? Studies have shown that schools in predominantly black neighborhoods 
often lack adequate resources, resulting in lower quality education for black students. On the other hand, predominantly white schools tend to receive better funding and resources, providing their students with greater opportunities to excel academically. Because when you go to certain schools within black communities, you would notice that they have old textbooks or worn out textbooks. They don't have proper lighting. They don't have proper nutrition when it comes to the cafeteria and things of that nature. There's this a whole slew of issues of not being properly funded like their white counterparts. Now, some of you are going to dive into the finance. You're going to dive into the demographics, the economics, depending on where people live and reside. But even that is systematically done. So black people as a whole are not going to college and graduating with said degrees in order to compete in certain industries. But not only that, we are not getting the loans. We're not receiving the loans even though we have the same similar credit scores in order to obtain student loans in order to get into colleges. And let's not get into the, the white supremacist narrative that black people aren't smart or black people aren't as competitive or black people aren't as intelligent. Yes, we are, if not more. So this had me to go back a little bit prior to the Brown versus Board of Education. I started to look at certain states. And as we know, one of the major states on this map not Texas, not Oklahoma, not Tennessee, where the KKK derived from, not Alabama, not Georgia, but no other than Ron DeSantis, Florida. This is one of the reasons why Ron DeSantis will not be the president of the United States, because he shows blatant racism through code words such as CRT, as well as stop woke, meaning we are anti-black 100% of the time. Because anytime you ask, one of these Republicans, you ask one of these Democrats, you ask any political figure of these terms that they have been sensationalizing, what does CRT mean? Let me take a shot as being a political figure and trying to define CRT, critical race theory. I believe it is a cross-disciplinary examination of how laws social and political movements and media shape and are shaped by social conception of race and ethnicity. CRT, believe it or not, originated in the 1970s in the legal academia as a means of examining the role of race and racism in American law. It has since expanded to other fields such as education, history, and psychology because CRT scholars argue that racism is not simply the product of individual bias or prejudice, but is also embedded in legal systems and in policies. They contend that the systematic racism has a profound impact on the lives of black people leading to despair. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm a political figure. It has a profound impact on the lives of people of color leading to disparities in areas such as education, housing, employment, and health care. CRT has been the subject of much debate in recent years, with some critics arguing that it is divisive and teaches students to view the world through a lens of race. However, me being a huge component and supporter of CRT, I argue that it is important too for, for us to understand and address in racism in American society. Because when you look at the key tenets of CRT, race is a social construct, not a biological reality. So I believe that my white and black and Hispanic and Asian brothers and sisters are all alike. We don't have any difference in biology. Do we have difference in DNA? Do we have different in melanin? Oh, uh, well, let me just finish my point here, sir. Segregation. What does that mean? I feel what like Latinos are very picky about who they embrace or how they embrace. Puerto Ricans, and I'm sure other cultures, um, experience the same thing. If if you're too light, you're not Puerto Rican enough. I hear that all the time. I I, I, literally, I literally hear that all the time. I remember meeting my cousins in Puerto Rico. Obviously, they speak heavy Spanish, and I'm white as milk. And the ESA gringa, who's this? Mm -hmm. I I don't know who you are. Oh, you're my cousin, huh? You know, it's a real thing, and that's rooted in like history. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. This is nothing new. And I'm sure that that's in a lot of cultures. Racism not simply the product of individual bias or prejudice, but is also embedded in legal systems and policies. The law is not neutral, but is instead shaped by the dominant racial ideology because people of color, you know, like yourself, are not monolithic. And your experiences with racism vary depending on the race, class, gender, and other factors. Not just your race. It could be your class. 
because you're one of those poor black folk. That's why you may not understand the points I'm making here because CRT can be used to challenge the status quo and work towards a more just society. Now, we understand that CRT is a complex and nuanced theory and that there is no single definition that universally accepted, right? Well, I have to argue with that, and I just have a couple of things that, no, we're not all the same on an anatomy and biological level. Uh, black people, we have more melanin in our skin than any other race, and race is not a social construct. It is indeed a fact. Now, if you want to throw out race, then we are different people, so we can throw out race. Okay, we're no longer black. Then what are we? We're still different. You're not the same complexion. You don't have the same melanin. I'm not stating that, oh, because we have an extra calf muscle, because that's one of the white supremacist things to say. That's because we can jump high and run faster. But no, we are a different people. And not just based on our culture, but we are different people on a molecular level. So everything you just said is hogwash. CRT is a white supremacist narrative that was constructed on both sides, Democrat and Republican, to do exactly what your state is doing right now, is trying to eradicate slavery from the history books. It says right here in one of your forms, it says HB7, formerly called the Individual Freedom, measures bans educators from teaching certain topics. HRB7, formerly called the Individual Freedom Measure, bans educators from teaching certain topics related to race and is designed in part to prevent teachers from making students feel guilt or shame about their race because of historical events. What are you guys ashamed of? Black history is American history. We are the very foundation of this country. Our ancestors and forefathers built this with blood, sweat, tears. So by you implementing some sort of CRT or anti-woke or stop woke act, it's the most racist, white supremacist thing that you could ever do. Because you didn't pull up a black panel of black empowerment scholars to educate you on the issue. But no, you double down with your Stop Woke Act. Now, on the one hand, I can understand the Stop Woke Act has things that are going to restrict certain explicit sexual language and imagery, which I agree on some accounts. But when it comes to race... This is a way to kind of crowbar your way in in order to prevent the teaching of the historical past of the white supremacy country that was built on the backs of my forefathers and ancestors. And as of late, you stated here, Florida schools to tell kids slavery benefited black people. Not only have you doubled down, you tripled down. But we as foundational black Americans expect no less from a white supremacy system that owns and operates globally. When I dive into the numbers of the demographics based upon the population of America, it states the U.S. population is 336 million. And if we are, which I don't currently believe, 13.4% of the population, that means there's around 45 million black Americans. And based upon those numbers, going back to how we are overrepresented in the prison system, we understand that racial discrimination is a large part in black society when it comes to housing, sentencing, and policing. It also states frequently explains why data shows stark disproportionalities in just an involvement for black people. The research below goes into more detail. So when we look at the key statistics here, and this is coming from prisonpolicy.org, percent of black Americans in the U.S. is 13% plus. Percent of people in prison or jail who are black, 38%. Percent of people serving life, life without parole, life without parole or virtual life sentences who are black, 48 percent. So they're stating almost 50 percent of people who are serving life and life without parole are black. Arrest rate for blacks versus whites. Blacks are 6,109 versus whites who are 2,795 and understanding that whites are the majority in this country, anywhere from around 70 to 76 percent. We understand the disparities and inaccuracies in the percentage based upon the people who are currently incarcerated. Also, number of arrests of black Americans in 2018, 2.8 million. So we can easily round up to 3 million when we come to 2023, heading to 2024. It also states percent of people on probation or parole who are black, 30%. They're stating that 30% of the people in America that's on parole are black. 
when we are only 13%, according to them, of the population. Black individuals account for 69% of police stops and 62% of individuals arrested. And this is in Philadelphia. Think about that. White people account for only 18% of police stops and 21% of arrests. So think about it like this, family. Seven in 10 people are black that get pulled over and stopped by the police. And out of that seven people, six of them goes to jail. Now, when you talk about the discrepancies in law enforcement and the wrong conviction of black people, they can easily say you resisted arrest, you were not cooperating with police. They have a textbook of reasons and bullshit laws and infractions that they can bestow upon you in order to lock you up. And it states that despite the fact that black and white people make up similar shares of the city's population. Next, the conviction rate in 2019 for black people statewide was 3.1 times higher than for white people. So we have a, a three times higher chance of being convicted than white people, even though they're majority of the population, even though that their crimes are not being reported, even though they, they get let go when they murder someone. We're giving you a warning. Don't you murder anyone else. I encourage everyone to go over to Professor Black Truth Channel. Every Friday, he does a crime report. He's exposing his white supremacist society and how their news stories are not front page news like black people are. Relative to a white driver traveling the same speed, black people are 24 to 33% more likely to be stopped for speeding and pay 23 to 34% more in fines. Well, quite frankly, family, that's no news to us because we live it each and every day. Because when it comes to media representation, we understand you guys use it as a powerful tool that shapes society perceptions around the world when it comes to black folk. White individuals tend to be overrepresented positively in the media, while black individuals are often portrayed stereotypically or negatively. This lack of diverse and accurate representation further perpetuates racial biases because you guys don't do too much about your serial killers. You guys don't do too much about your deadbeat dads. You guys don't do too much about men and women unaliving their children and blaming it on black people. No, y'all don't do too many things of that. Recognizing and acknowledging one privilege in the first step towards promoting equality, does it not? That's why you won't do it. Understanding the ways in which privilege operates is essential for fostering meaningful change. Identifying and examining one's own privilege, okay, because you always ask black folk, how can we fix it? How can we change? What are, what are the answers? You guys have all the problems, but you guys have none of the answers. Well, first of all, we didn't create the problems. So why would we create the solutions, even though we know the solutions? Because we know it's necessary to understand the pervasive nature of white privilege. You have to identify and examine your own selves other than us telling you what it is, because quite frankly, you already know. Because challenging stereotypes and biases, we understand is a crucial in dismantling, we understand that it is crucial in dismantling white privilege. Engaging in open conversation with the right people, it may, it can create a more inclusive society where black folk are looked at very, very different than we are now. Because the efforts to dismantle systematic racism, it must be intentional and persistent. This is going to involve challenging discriminatory practices in institutions and actively working towards dismantling systematic barriers. First and foremost, as black folk, as foundational black Americans, the one thing that we can do is start to support black owned businesses because that will foster economic empowerment within the black community and contribute to breaking down economic disparities for our own selves. We understand that white privilege is deeply entrenched in society issues that impact black Americans in a number of ways. Recognizing and dismantling white privilege requires confronting uncomfortable truths in white America and engaging in challenging conversation sometimes because sometimes you're just wasting your time by acknowledging privilege and advocating for policy changes. That is how we get things done, by galvanizing, organizing, unifying, and pushing policy change based upon the laws of this white supremacist society. We know we don't have any friends, as Nilly Fuller said. We can work towards 
a future where we can receive justice just like Asians in the LGBT community. Now, here are some questions you can ask yourself to understand my point just a bit better here. Question, is white privilege a recent phenomenon? Answer, no. White privilege has historical roots dating back centuries that still impact and affect black people today. Question, can white individuals be allies in the fight against white privilege? Answer, probably not, but you can involve yourself in supporting and advocating for black communities actively challenging white privilege while assisting and supporting policy change. Question, why is it essential to recognize one privilege? Answer, recognizing one's privilege is crucial for fostering empathy and understanding the experiences of black Americans. Question, how can individuals contribute to breaking down systematic racism? Answer, individuals can contribute by engaging in open conversations, supporting policy changes, and educating themselves and others about racism and black history, which is a pivotal point of history in America because we are the culture. Question, what role does education play in combating white privilege? Answer, education is vital in raising awareness about racism and how it has played a pivotal role in the current conditions that black Americans that we live in today. The existence of white privilege has a far reaching impact on our black communities. It perpetuates systematic inequalities, limiting access to opportunities and resources. Consequently, we face challenges in achieving upward mobility and breaking free from the cycles of poverty. The psychological impact of white privilege on black people is very profound, let me tell you, brothers and sisters. Constantly experiencing discrimination and witnessing disparities can lead to feelings of frustration, anger, and hopelessness. This can affect mental health and overall well-being. There was never black privilege in this country. Now, with this information, you can use this as an offensive weapon against the system of white supremacy. Black first.